Okay, amen. Um, If you have your Bibles, open them up to the book of Romans, chapter 15. Romans 15, we'll be looking at verse 1 to 6. And the title of the message is uh, Following Christ. So um, for the last couple of weeks, we... We've been looking at the subject of Christian liberty. Chapter 14 was dedicated to this topic. And and Paul was concerned in chapter 14 that Christians uh, not divide over non-essential things like eating and not eating, like the eating and not eating of certain meats and other things that had mainly to do with one's own personal conscience and were not vital uh, to a person's relationship with God. And Paul was contic- particularly concerned for the weaker believers, uh, which were the ones still having some trouble with their conscience um, when it came to observing the dietary and ceremonial restrictions under the Old Testament law, and also those who were struggling to eat meat that had been sacrificed uh, to idols. Many of, the, many of the people in the church had, had been come out of idolatry. And but in those days, uh, the meat, much of the meat that was sold in the markets, had gone through some ritual, um, sacrificial, uh, you know, thing, and so their conscience was bothered by buying it and eating it. And so Paul said, "He who is weak only eats vegetables." And so that's what what chapter fourteen um, had to do with. And Paul instructed those stronger in the faith who had a clearer understanding of their liberty in Jesus Christ not to despise their weaker brothers and sisters in the Lord, but to receive them with patience and not to use their liberty in such a way that might stumble the weaker believer. And so, as we come to chapter 15, um, Paul continued to speak on this issue and called upon those stronger in the faith not to live to please themselves. Look at verse 1 and 2 in chapter 15. So Paul said, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples, that's the New King James, it means weaknesses of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification, or building up. So those who are strong in the faith and enjoy liberty in Christ and understand the doctrine of justification by faith, that a person is saved through simply believing in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And they've come to understand what it means to walk in the Spirit and to be led by the Holy Spirit and and thus feel no obligation towards the religious duties um, under the law or whatever it might be that has no real bearing on a person's relationship to the Lord, uh, must not use their spiritual knowledge selfishly and blow off those who are weaker and still struggling in their conscience to come to a place of spiritual maturity and understanding. And you know, that's the temptation for those who are stronger Christians, to be frustrated with those who are not, and who have not progressed to the same level of understanding that they have. And so again, verse 1, Paul instructed those who were stronger uh, to bear with the weaknesses of the weak and not to please themselves. In other words, don't use your liberty in a callous and self-serving way uh, with the expectation that everyone else should be where you are. Because, you know, if you're a believer, we're all in different stages in our growth in the Lord. And um, we, each of us have different hang-ups in our conscience. Now, in the early church, it had mainly to do with eating certain meats because under the Old Testament law, uh, many of the Jews who had come to Christ, they had grown their, up their entire lives observing the Mosaic Law. And under the, under the Mosaic Law, there were certain animals that were designated as unclean. You know, one of the famous ones we all probably know about is pork, right? And even to this day, many of the Jews uh, still don't eat pork because it goes against uh, the Old Testament Law. But the teaching of the New Testament is that in Christ, everything's clean. You know, those things were symbolic. They had to do with the Israelites. But in Jesus Christ, Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things 
have become new. God has given His Holy Spirit to the believer. And thus, we don't live by the letter of the Old Testament law. We live by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is working in our hearts, if, in the believer's heart, to bring us into line with the will of God, and most importantly, with the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments, uh, the things that are you know, truly sinful. The Lord is working in our hearts to purify us of those things. And so the, the more technical aspects under the law, like the dietary restrictions, ceremonial, uh, religious, things that had to do with being uh, ceremonially unclean, not so much apply any longer to the person who's come to Jesus. But Paul is exhorting those who are stronger to still bear with those who haven't come to that understanding. Now the word bear in verse 1 refers to picking up and carrying a burden. And in the Bible, it is used of carrying a pitcher of water in Mark chapter 14, verse 13. It's used of carrying a man in Acts 21, verse 35, and of bearing a yoke in Acts 15, verse 10. So that gives you a picture of what it is. It's, 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 the, it's putting some effort into this. It's picking something up and carrying something for someone else that they're struggling with, whatever it might be. Um, now, I, I like the way that John MacArthur uh, put this. He said, to bear the weaknesses of fellow believers is not simply to tolerate those weaknesses, but to help carry them. There's a big difference between that, those two things. It's one thing to tolerate someone else's weakness or something about them that maybe annoys you, but it's a, it's a whole different matter to actually get involved in helping them carry it or helping them along. He said, by not being critical or condescending, and by showing respect for sincere views or practices that we may not agree with. Uh, we are not to argue about minor issues or be critical of those who may still be sensitive about a former religious practice or taboo. Now this takes patience, doesn't it? It takes patience. It, it takes a lot of patience at times. But the strong Christian needs to remember that Christian maturity does not lie only in the using of one's liberty, but also in the laying of it down for the sake of helping someone else. Two aspects to liberty. It's one thing to have knowledge. It's another thing to have wisdom, right? Wisdom is the application of knowledge. It's one thing that you know something. It's a much different matter to know how to use that knowledge in a way that is wise, in a way that is correct, and most importantly, in a way that pleases the Lord. You know, knowledge without wisdom is actually very dangerous. You know, it's, it's, and it's usually those who have a little bit, a li it's, as it's been said, a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. You know, um, it's usually those who have just a little bit of knowledge that think they know everything. Um, but it's, much, it's a much different thing to weigh everything out and then apply wisdom to the knowledge that you have. So Paul is calling for wisdom. Don't use your knowledge in a self-serving kind of way. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8.13, concerning this whole aspect of food, he said, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Boy, that is the will of God right there. Paul's not thinking only of Paul. He's thinking about the others as well in the church, his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, it's not that Paul couldn't eat meat. He knew that. He, he knew he was free from the dietary restrictions of the law, and he also knew that meat that had been sacrificed to idols could not defile him. But for the sake of the one whose conscience was still weak, in this respect, he said he would refrain. And that is what it means to walk in love. That's what it means to walk in love. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 22, listen to what Paul had to say about this whole issue and he gives his own personal example. Paul said, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means 
saves some. See Paul's heart? He set the example here for us to follow when it comes to our liberty in Jesus Christ. You know, though we are free from all men, and that is true, we are free from all men in whatever convictions they may hold when it comes to things that aren't commanded in Scripture. But yet, for the sake of Christ and the gospel, we should be willing to set that liberty aside if it would help in leading someone to Christ. That's the principle. Or, also, if we must do it for the sake of not offending someone who knows Christ. And so the idea is using our liberty with an other's first mentality. Let me say that again. Using our liberty with an other's first mentality. Yes, I am free in Christ. But I'm not going to misuse that freedom if it will hurt you or someone else. That's the... That's the attitude that Paul is seeking to cultivate. As he said in verse 2, again, I'll read to you verse 2 here, chapter 15. He said, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. Now, the ultimate example of this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Now, Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of one who willingly laid down his own rights and prerogatives. If anyone had the right to do his own will and to please himself, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. For he is God from all of eternity. He's the second person in the blessed Holy Trinity. Um, In John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, speaking of Christ, we read this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ is God. Always was and always will be. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus declared, I and my Father are one. In John 8, 58, Jesus said to the Jews, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He took the name of God to himself. Remember, the Lord revealed himself to Moses as the great I am. Remember, Moses asked when Moses was at the burning bush as, um, in, the, in the wilderness, Moses asked, what is your name? Who, who, as the Lord commanded Moses to go to, uh, to Egypt and deliver the people, God said to him, tell, tell the people, I am has sent you. Great I am, Jehovah. Jesus was claiming to be Jehovah. Jesus Christ, as God, possesses in himself all the attributes of the divine nature. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, and God only wise. Paul said of him in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. You know, when Jesus claimed to be God and to be co-equal with the Father, as he did on many occasions, he did not consider it to be robbery because he himself is God. And you remember the Jews accused him of blasphemy. Who do you make yourself out to be, they would say. Remember when Jesus... uh, when they brought a, um, a paralytic to him and, and the, the house that he, it was Peter's mother-in-law's house, the house was so crowded that they couldn't get this paralytic to Jesus. But remember, they, they took him up to the roof and they let him down on ropes. The first thing Jesus said to this man who had this um, physical ailment was, son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And the Jews right away picked up on that and they said, Only God can forgive sins. Who do you make yourself to be? But Jesus there was claiming the rights of God because he is God. But Paul went on to say of him in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, that he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So the Lord Jesus Christ, who was God from all of eternity, in order to come to this world and be our Savior, took upon himself, or took unto himself, human nature. 
He was implanted by God's Spirit into the Virgin Mary's womb. He became a man in every sense. Fully God, yet fully man. It's the mystery of the Incarnation. God became a man. And he lived as a man on this earth. And a common man at that. Have you ever, have you ever considered the way he came? You know, Jesus was not born into a family of notoriety, wealth, or status. In fact, he was born into a family of low status and a family of low income. Um, as to his outward appearance, Isaiah the prophet prophesied concerning him that he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, and that there was nothing in his, in his appearance that we should desire him. He wasn't brought up in a good neighborhood. He, um, certainly not one that royalty would have been from. Uh, do you remember in John's Gospel when Philip found Nathanael and he told him that they, that they had found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, Nathanael said this, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus didn't receive the education of the elites. In John's Gospel, chapter 7, when Jesus was teaching in the temple, we read that the Jews were amazed and asked, How did this man get such learning without having been taught? And when Jesus began to reveal who he really was, the Son of God, many of the Jews said this, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then, then that he says, I have come down from heaven? He made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant. He came in the likeness of men. And they didn't believe in him because they had visions of grandeur when it came to the Messiah. They didn't understand that Jesus did not come the first time to please himself, as Paul said here in Romans 15, verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself. The only one who ever had the right to do it. The only man ever born that had every right to do it, did not do it. But he came not to do his own will, to do the will of the Father who sent him. And thus he emptied himself of his glory and took upon himself the form of a servant. He came in the likeness of men. And Paul, as Paul said, that he became obedient the point of death, even the death of the cross. The humiliation of Jesus Christ is the example for each of us to follow. He humbled himself. Paul said there in Philippians that, Have, let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ. That we would esteem others better than ourselves. It all falls into place with what we're talking about here. And, and the only, again, the only one who ever had the right to didn't please himself. Now the Apostle Peter, in his first letter, said that we who have believed in Jesus Christ are to follow in his steps. Follow in his steps. He showed us in his perfect life what man was supposed to look like. The way we were supposed to live. Submitted to God. Humble servants. Not living to please ourselves, but living to please God. And so, just as Christ did not please himself, as Paul said here in Romans 15, 3, so we must not live to please ourselves if we're going to follow him. We're called to please God in every area of our lives, including in the... What it really all goes back to is the principle that Paul laid down in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. You remember what Romans 12, 1 says? Paul said there, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. You see, that one verse is the foundation for all Christian living. It all comes back to this. And so if you have not really surrendered yourself to God, then Christian living and character will be non-existent in your life because the self-life and God cannot coexist. Let me say that again. The self-life and God cannot coexist. Self-centeredness and being a disciple of Jesus Christ do not go together. They just can't. 
You know, and this is the truth that many churches and Christian organizations for years have failed to emphasize. And a result, and as a result, is, is so much of what passes for Christianity today hardly resembles what we find written in the pages of Scripture. You know, and many have been misled to believe that they can have it their way and that they can do their will in life and yet still follow Jesus Christ. But listen, that is not true. It is not true. But the message we so often hear from the modern church is that you can. You know, there's this billboard that I drive by on the freeway um, quite frequently for Cal Baptist University. And it says in big, bold, bold black letters, live your purpose. But you know, they got it wrong. It should not say, live your purpose, but rather, live his purpose. Live his purpose. But you know, that one little phrase on that billboard speaks volumes about what is wrong with the thinking of so many today who have placed themselves in the center rather than God. And sadly, many churches and Christian organizations today spend most of their time and effort in seeking to Christianize worldliness and self-centeredness in order to accommodate those who at the end of the day are simply unwilling to surrender their lives fully to God and become a living sacrifice. But if you can't be a living sacrifice, you're at a dead end in the road and there will be no progress in your life. There will be no Christian character worked in you. Because Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. No man can serve two masters. And you know, this whole idea that you can have it your way and still follow the Lord is something that you'll never find taught in the Scripture. And you know, Jesus never sugarcoated the truth about what it meant to follow him. Jesus never sugarcoated the truth. In fact, quite the opposite. He told the multitudes to count the cost. Luke chapter 14, verse 33, he declared to the crowd of people following him, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. You know, these are, these are hard truths that we don't like to hear. But you see, if I'm going to be his disciple then nothing can come between me and him. Not even the closest of family relationships. He must always come first. Even if it means losing all that I have. That's what it means to count the cost. Have you counted the cost? Following Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him pick up his cross, deny himself, follow me. You can't live a self-centered life and follow him at the same time. He doesn't give you that luxury. He doesn't give you that option. He says, choose me. And then I'll show you what I've got for your life. Offer your, love, your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. And then I'll work my will, my way into you. This is where it all starts where it all begins. And even Jesus did not live to please himself. Why then would we believe that we could? Why then would we believe that we could do that? God help us. Now, it's not easy following Christ, and Jesus, but Jesus never said that it would be. You know, Jesus said, narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. But God has not left us without hope. This is the other side of the coin. If you choose to follow him, and you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, God will honor your faith. And he, will not, he has not left you without comfort or without hope. Look at verse 4. Paul said, for whatever things were written before 
were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now Paul's referring to the Old Testament. The example of all those who have gone before. You know, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 is dedicated to this very subject. The author of Hebrews there calls upon believers because we are surrounded, he said, by such a great cloud of witnesses, talking about all the Old Testament saints. You know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joseph, um, the list goes on and on. All those who lived this life of faith, who went on the narrow road, who followed God at all costs. The, the author there says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight that's, and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, our ultimate example, and he is the author of, and the perfecter of our faith. And, and the, the, the book of Hebrews goes on to say that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. And the joy that was set before him was our salvation was the kingdom of God to come and us being redeemed and being a part of that kingdom. You see, if Jesus didn't go to the cross, we couldn't be saved. We'd, we'd still be in our sins. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured it all. And so for the joy that's set before us, we must endure as well. We must follow him on this narrow road as he leads. But it's our choice. No one's going to make that choice for me. The Lord laid out the terms of discipleship. If you want to follow me, you can. Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But here's the thing. You can come if you want to, but do you want to? Have you counted the cost? This easy believism that is so prevalent today falls so far short of the biblical definition of faith. The Bible says faith without works is dead. Faith involves much more than just an intellectual agreement with a list of facts. It involves the mind, yes, the heart, but also the will. It shows itself in action. It picks up its cross, denies itself, and follows him, whatever the cost. It presents itself as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. This is faith. This is commitment. And you know, in, this, in the days we're living in, you have, if you don't have a living faith and a true commitment, God help you. Because this world is eating people up, left and right. It's becoming harder and harder to follow Christ. You know, it used to be easier here in America. But the devil is working overtime. He's taking control of almost every aspect of our culture, of the schools, the universities, even our jobs. He's moving in. And so I think this word from the Lord about counting the cost is becoming even more relevant. We must count the cost. But we're not, remember... We do so not without hope. We do so not without hope. Because as Paul said, the things which were written were written for our learning. Read your Old Testament. Read about those who have gone before. Read about Abraham. You know, Abraham was promised a son. But he didn't receive that son for 25 years. For 25 years he wandered through the land that God had promised him. Waiting for for the promise of God. You know, the Bible says that we need to follow the example of those who have gone before as well. The book of Hebrews says, don't be sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Faith and patience. Be patient. Be patient. God hasn't left us without hope. Just as the scriptures 
It's just as the scripture testifies not only of the sufferings of Christ and of the difficulties of the Christian life, listen, it also testifies of the glory that awaits all those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ. As one day, if we continue in the faith, we will hear those blessed words from our Savior. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, the Lord will say, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. This is our hope. Yes, there's a cross to bear, but never forget, there's a crown to receive on the other side. This is the life of faith. And so, the things which were written, both in the Old and New Testament, they were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Verse 5 and 6, Paul said, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul closed this section with a plea to God for the church to be unified, to be like-minded. Oh, how important it is that we be like-minded in our Christian profession and faith. Because if we're not like-minded, then the church will be divided. And that's, that's the devil's will, that the church be divided, that we divide over non-essential things. And so Paul here was pleading to God that they not divide over things that didn't matter, but that they be patient with one another over those things that aren't really essential, like the eating of meat or not eating of meat. He's, he pleads for them to be patient with one another, and he calls God the God of patience and comfort. Aren't you glad that that's the God we serve? He's a God of patience. He's a God of comfort. And whatever he calls you to do, even though it's, it looks hard, and even though it's a narrow road, and it's a difficult way, he says this, I will be with you. I will be with you. For the Bible says, God declared in his word, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Maybe you're faced with a difficult decision today. Maybe the Lord is speaking to you about your life. And maybe you're, you're wrestling. And you're struggling to carry on down the narrow road. Or maybe you've never really even presented your body as a living sacrifice. Maybe you've never really surrendered to God. Maybe you've just been giving lip service. Listen, today you hear his voice. The Bible says, don't harden your heart. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, the Lord said, I will come in to him, dine with him, and he with me. You know, in the Bible, eating always speaks of fellowship, friendship, communion, relationship. God wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to comfort you. He wants to give you his peace. But you have to agree to the terms of, of discipleship. Now, one thing I think you can be very happy about is that it's not like apples in terms of terms and conditions. <laughs> It's not, you don't have to scroll 3,000 pages down and read all those things. You know, we, we're always asked to agree to the terms you know, when it comes to Apple or you know, these electronic devices today. And no one ever reads them and we just agree so we can carry on. Well, aren't you glad God's terms aren't like that? It doesn't take, you don't need a lawyer to come in and, and look over the document. It's simple. Oh, here's, the, here's the terms. Follow me. That's it. It's that simple. Follow me. But it's your choice to do it. He won't make you do it. But he, off he, op he offers that to you. He's the God of patience. And know this, if you choose to follow him, if you choose to pick up your cross, deny yourself today, and follow him, know this, he's the God of patience. Comfort. And he will help you in everything that you face. And so Paul pleaded to God for them to be like-minded. And to, you know, to keep the main focus of the church on Christ and the Word of God. Because that alone is the formula 
for success in the Christian life. If we keep Jesus at the center and commit ourselves to the study of God's word and draw that patience and that comfort from God through his word, if we look to the examples that have been set, and we pattern our lives according to those who've gone before us in the Old Testament as the Old Testament saints. The Bible says, follow their faith. We can be sure of this. We will be unified as a church, and God will be glorified. That's what it's all about. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And now, Lord, I pray that as we prepare to take communion and to remember the greatness of the sacrifice that you made on our behalf, Lord, I pray you would search and try each heart today. That none of us would partake of of the elements in an unworthy manner or just flippantly eat the bread and drink the cup. But we would examine our own hearts And ask ourselves, have we agreed to the terms and conditions of discipleship? Yes, salvation's a free gift. But in order for me to have that gift, I must agree to your terms. I must surrender my life. I must become a living sacrifice. And so, Lord, search each heart today. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The usher.